Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to RIA's Unlocking Innovation webinars, day five. Yeah, it sounds like some sort of space journey, doesn't it, or something, you know, but um, uh, we split what would normally be a, a one day, whole day conference, a physical conference out into five uh, webinars, picking the themes around our subject of digital journeys for passengers and freight. Monday, we specifically looked at the issues for SMEs working in rail for the first time. Tuesday, we looked at better journeys for passengers. Wednesday, how we can use digital and data better for freight. Some really good results in that, that event. Yesterday, we looked at mobility as a service connecting with rail. And today, we're going to focus on the host city and region of Leeds. And we're going to look at how Leeds is going to build a 21st century mass transit system for Leeds and the city region, uh, which it can be proud of. So these events are brought to you by the Railway Industry Association uh, in association with their partners, UK Rail Research and Innovation Network. So that's Southampton, uh, Huddersfield and Birmingham universities and another tier of universities beyond that. And also the sponsorship of Network Rail for which we're very grateful and they've played a very active part as well. RIA itself, the Railway Industry Association is the trade association for suppliers to the rail industry. Our members cover the whole rail system infrastructure builders and maintainers, rolling stock, signaling control systems, communications, and our members span the largest global corporations like Hitachi, Bombardier, Talis, Alstom, and even IBM. Uh, and yet 60% of our members are SMEs and startups. As a trade association, we do the things that members can't easily do alone. Unlocking Innovation is a, is a rear brand. These events have been taking place regularly for a number of years now. This year, there'll be five events in total, and they'll either be uh, webinars or physical events if and when we can get back to running them. What we're trying to do with uh, Unlocking Innovation is we're trying to highlight this, the challenges in the industry to suppliers. What's there to be done? How is it going to be funded? Uh, we're hoping to share resources which are there to help you with innovation. There's absolutely an enormous amount of support available if you can connect with it. Um, we are there to give SMEs the chance to pitch innovative approaches, and we hear two great elevator pitches today from really exciting SMEs in this sector. And in normally in a physical event, we would allow SMEs to exhibit their work and give space for networking. Well, exhibition is out, I'm afraid, uh, but the networking, well, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. And if you look at the dialog box in the top right hand corner of your screen, the grey box, there's a questions tab. If you click on that, you'll be able to type questions. We'll bulk those up and at the at the end, the last 15 or 20 minutes, we'll be having a Q&A session. But overall, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to create new supply chains and we're trying to refresh existing ones. So those are the things to look out for. Right, we are going to kick off. I'm really, really pleased to have West Yorkshire Combined Authority with us uh, uh, in, the, in the form of Tom Gifford. And uh, Tom is head of Transport Systems Innovation. Uh, and Tom's going to tell us about the, the ambition, the challenge that Leeds and West Yorkshire has got for building uh, a mass transit system. So, Tom, I'm going to hand over to you. Tom Gifford. Good morning, all. It's fantastic to be on this webinar today. It's my first webinar. I've done many presentations over the years, but I've never done a webinar before. So uh, I'm looking forward to today, see how it goes. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you around West Yorkshire and mass transit and how what our plans are for a 21st century mass transit city, uh, system for the city region. So I'm um, really grateful to the intro introduction there and the real event around unlocking, um, uh, um, unlocking innovation as part of the Leeds Digital Festival. So um, I thought I'd start with this slide, um, which sets out just some images around mass transit. Um, and I'm going to talk through where we are of the development work so far in a moment. But before we get into before we get into it, um, these images on the front cover are, are really important to us because what they do is they they try to set out what we're trying to achieve without being too specific on what the actual vehicle is. So we've got four four images on this front cover. One showing advanced engineering. A second image showing smart digital infrastructure, a third image showing seamless accessibility, and the fourth image talking about big construction. 
because ultimately what we're talking about here is, is a mass transit system and there is significant construction involved in it. So we, we haven't planned for the, for the traditional, let's show the front end of the vehicle image, um, because we, we want to really capture the best innovation from the industry and understand what the best in class actually is. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So I'm going to talk you through a few slides now, and I think that there's opportunity for questions at the end and also to use the, the comment and chat functions of webinar as we go through. So I'm going to try and scroll through to the next slide now. Let's see if this works. So um, I knew I'd do that, two slides. Um, the first slide, a um, bit of facts about Leeds City Region. I'm not sure how many of you know about Leeds City Region. It's a big region, there's a, it's a large population. Um, we've got three million people. It's the fastest growing young population outside of London. 66.9 billion um, economy, um, 1.4 million jobs. Um, 126,000 businesses, more than any other LEP area outside of the southeast, but the highest concentration of academic institutions um, and the largest regional financial se sector outside of London. And we still have a really significant manufacturing centre. And I think this all demonstrates the size and scale of Leeds City Region and the need for providing a transport system which is fit for purpose. Now, I could talk a, long, a lot around the COVID situation as well. I'm not going to go into that today. Um, we all know and understand the situation. Um, so I'm going to talk to where what, what our ambitions are beyond COVID rather than getting into the here and now operational matters. So the next slide. Let's see if this moves on. There we go. Our ambition for the region. So as a region, the West Yorkshire Combined Authority is the local transport authority for West Yorkshire. And West Yorkshire covers the five districts of Leeds, Bradford, Calderdale, Kirklees and Wakefield. And together, they form, this forms the economic powerhouse for, for, for much of the north. Um, I think we, we have, as a region, we have four key priorities. We've got one around boosting productivity, um, one around addressing the climate emergency, enabling inclusive growth and delivering a 21st century transport system. And I'm sure, that, well, the, these, these priorities were written before the COVID situation, and I'm sure there will in time be a, a fifth priority around how we uh, respond and address to the COVID challenges which we're all facing. We have as a region a series of transport strategy targets as well. So these are all sorts of targets that are covering really sustainable modes and encouraging these sustainable travel. And I'm sure we can all see out today the, the kind of the benefits of um, the walking and cycling and the reductions in, in car travel. Um, and we have targets around reductions in car travel. Um, and it might be that in the future these targets change and they might become stronger, but I don't think the direction of travel of these targets will change. So the, the move towards sustainable travel, the moves towards encouraging people to use bus and rail, walking and cycling, and discouraging car travel. I think those trajectories will, 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 will continue. So obviously we need to reflect on longer term implications of COVID-19 on, on mass transit. Um, but as a city region, um, we, are, we are still forecasting that this, the scale of the economic opportunity in our region is really significant um, and there's a real opportunity for us to create many thousands of new jobs in our region over the next decade. We're seeing our region become increasingly centralised, so um, in increasing numbers of knowledge intensive jobs, um, jobs which um, are focused in our towns and city centres, increasing numbers of high rise office blocks etc in Leeds city centre. Um, and what this is all doing is placing a lot of pressure on our transport system. And we, we, we've, we've seen this before, before COVID kicked in, a significant, significant pressure on our transport system. And whilst we're already investing in, through various funding streams of a growth deal, connecting leads and transforming cities fund, there's still a significant long-term pressure on our transport system to get people to the jobs of the future um, and the, the leisure opportunities of the future. And to meet those current and future demands, we're still forecasting that some form of mass urban transit is likely to be acquired in West Yorkshire. This is a system which can carry two to three hundred people per vehicle, more than a bus, bike or car. So um, it's a different type of system to what we see um, at the moment. Now, in looking at this, West Yorkshire has a real opportunity. Now, at, by not having a mass transit system at the moment, we have the opportunity to learn the lessons from other systems around the UK and beyond and bring together the best components of, of, of diff different systems from around the world. Um, 
to build a best in class system for West Yorkshire, which in effect leapfrogs other regions. Now, there is also the opportunity for us not to not to, to look back on the past around systems that should come forwards and leads in the past, but really focus on what how technologies have moved forwards over the last dec decade um, and to make sure we are making the most of those opportunities. And this slide here was in effect the starting gun for, 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 for West Yorkshire, for looking at those types of technologies and the market testing, which I'm about to talk about. Now, these are just a selection of systems. There are many systems across, across the world, but some components of these which we really liked, we liked the Birmingham's innovative battery powered vehicles. Which are, being, which are now opened in, in the city centre of Birmingham. Um, we like the integration between the buses and, and tram in, in Nottingham. And there's some really interesting propulsion systems coming forward in Germany around induction power. Um, there's a lot of talk around hydrogen fuel cell technology in China. Um, there's autonomous trams operating in Germany and there's trackless trams operating in China. And what we want to do is to bring together the best bits of all of these systems so that we can understand and develop and plan for the right system for West Yorkshire. Now to do this formally, um, last year we, 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 fought, we started a advanced urban transit market testing and we had about 120 organisations respond to this market testing. Um, the market testing, we, we published a prospectus on the Combined Authorities website, um, issued a PIN notice and we had really strong turnout uh, from a range of different organizations, the types of organizations on your screen, plus many more. Now this, this market testing allowed us to ask a series of questions around how research development uh, and in, the, in the field of mass transit was going to develop over the next decade, how we can kind of plan for climate change, um, and what types of ticketing and um, digital connectivity we should be planning for in the future. And really we wanted to go into this with our eyes open of understanding where industry was coming from for the future and making sure that we were able to plan for the right system. So I've got about five minutes left of being of talking and then we're going to get into some of the other slides from, from the other people in the, um, the, the, the webinar today. And I just wanted to finish on some of the key messages which have come out of the market testing. So the types of feedback we're getting I've kind of we've got sections. I've got five sections to run through: two on this slide, and then three on the next. This slide sets out um, a series um, kind of autonomous operations and, and propulsion systems. Now we could spend hours talking about this, and and if there are people on the call today which want to to get into some of this in more more details, um, more than happy for you to to send in questions and pick those up after today's webinar as well. But from a, an autonomous perspective, what we've been told by industry is that um, yes, it's absolutely possible to have a autonomous tram system today, but it needs to be 100% segregated from all of the traffic. It needs to be up in, up, in, up, in a, up in the sky or underground in effect. As soon as you want to do a mass transit system, which is running with tra traffic, it will need to continue to have a driver. But there's the opportunities for autonomous depot operation and there's also the opportunities for a mixed use so maybe it has a driver in the city center in the in the street centers and maybe in the out of town sections you maybe you don't need a driver propulsion has been a really interesting area and very divisive when we from the feedback we've received from industry some manufacturers are very very pro hydrogen others really don't see it as a realistic alternative due to the cost of manufacturing transporting and storage i think our view as a result of the market testing is if you have a ready source of hydrogen available at your depot then absolutely you can have a mass transit system powered by hydrogen but until government policy policy changes um, i think it's going to be very difficult to come forward to a hydrogen powered mass transit system in west yorkshire all manufacturers saw saw enhanced battery propulsion as the right right type of solution in the short term and it's realistic to plan for a mass transit system without overhead wires um, in a in a in, in an urban center um, based on the feedback we've received three points here around connectivity and ticketing climate emergency and research and development number of respondees talked around the opportunities which 5g technology could have for controlling both the mass transit vehicles um, 
uh, but also the kind of the asset side of those vehicles as well, m managing the assets so that you'll move to a much more of an airline style asset management regime compared to how many of the asset, asset management regimes work in industry for mass transit vehicles at the moment. So real opportunity for us to think beyond uh, and think about how the evolution of, of technology can help us to both control the vehicles on a day-to-day -day basis and manage those assets. It's also a lot of discussion around how we use APIs, application performance interfaces, to, to allow much more open data, to allow um, um, the data to be used across all modes in a much more integrated form. The climate emergency and air quality came up a lot through the market testing and a lot of the feedback in this area was not necessarily around mass transit but it was around those complementary measures to what you need to put in place to support mass transit um, to make the case make the case overall for a city work um, around the opportunities for demand management for example but also around how the, um, mobility as a service and the local bus services can help to feed and integrate um, the mass transit offer. Um, research development came up a number of times and, and this point at the end around building in design redundancy is essential so that um, you are able to cater for changes over, over, over the course of the design life of the system. With the design life being 30, 40 years, um, if not longer, for these systems, technology will continue to evolve and we need to be able to adapt to that technology change as it moves forwards. Now, I'm going to keep to my time, so I'm going to, I'm going to move into the last slide. Um, and this slide, um, in effect, just summarizes where we are and kind of starts to set the challenge and the opportunity for, 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 for the region. And we're really interested, as the market testing has, has highlighted, to understand where industry is at the moment and understand where those um, innovation pockets are and make sure that we are applying the best technologies possible to the West Yorkshire system. Now, as I said, beginning we're at the early stages of mass transit development obviously there's a lot of history in West Yorkshire around mass transit but we've really come at this from the perspective of our eyes open about learning for the future but also looking at where those employment growth areas are making sure we understand where the the, um, the the demands for mass transit actually are and coming up with a clear plan for mass transit for West Yorkshire we've got commitment now from government through our West Yorkshire devolution deal uh, which was signed uh, a couple of days before lockdown um, up in um, the Innovation Centre at Leeds Nexus, Le University of Leeds. Um, and we've got commitment for working together with government to both develop and deliver mass transit during the 2020s. Um, we need to reflect on the longer term implications of the, the travel demand changes we're all seeing now, um, where, how long it will take to go back to uh, a, a new normal. Um, but irrespective of that, that might well um, increase the need for mass transit as we want to encourage um, and accelerate the change from, from the historic um, travel um, mode shares which you've seen in the past. We're really keen to come forward to a, a, a 21st century advanced mass transit system which leapfrogs other regions, but it still needs to be affordable and it still needs to be deliverable and, and offer value for money. We now are in the next stage of development work. We're looking at developing a transit strategic outline business case. We have Steer and Jacobs helping us with that work, uh, with the likelihood that that will report later on in the year. Um, and then from today, I'm really keen to understand best practice means in terms of ticketing, use of 5G, and how we can start to think about lower cost vehicle types and propulsion systems as we start to develop our mass transit proposals. So those are my slides um, and I'm more than happy to take questions as we get to the end of the session on, on, on where we are. I've kind of rattled through them really quickly and Richard's um, um, shared the screen again so he can um, hopefully take us through the next bit of the agenda. Yeah that's great, thank you very much indeed Tom. Uh, really really great to see the focus right from the beginning of the presentation on using the technology to serve the people of the Leeds City region because that's what transit systems are about. Uh, they're about the people and what we do for those people. And if one thing stands out from the whole presentation for me, it's ambition, which is a brilliant thing to have. So um, our next presenter is going to tell us about a really ambitious project as well, I think. Um, it's Warwick Manufacturing Group. Uh, WMG is part of what's known as the High Value Manufacturing Catapult. And that's one of a group of catapults, something like a billion pound a year programme, uh, which is there to support uh, industry 
in driving new ideas through to use actually out there in the marketplace, which is really what innovation is. So the guy that's driven this project now for a really quite a long time and has absolutely put everything into it is Dr. Nick Mallinson from Warwick University, Warwick Manufacturing Group. Nick, can I hand over to you, please? We can't see your camera at the moment, Nick, or hear you. Ah, good. Yeah, we can't hear you, Nick, at the moment. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Right. Over to you, Nick. Uh, well, good morning, and uh, the first presentation was very interesting. Um, I have to admit that I can remember travelling on a tram in Leeds in about 1960 before they disappeared. Um, so um, what I want to do in the next 10 minutes is just tell you something about a project that is running in Coventry. Um, uh, it's trying to do something at much lower cost than is generally possible with uh, traditional light rail. Trying to move it on. Why is it not? Oh, here we are. So um, I, I've been working in, in an area called Very Light Rail for the last seven years. Um, and there's been work going on to produce a lower cost uh, vehicle for branch lines. Uh, that work prompted Coventry City Council to contact me about four years ago to say that they were interested in very light rail and how it might uh, make a solution available to them uh, in the city. So the Coventry Very Light Rail project was driven really by the fact Coventry is growing very rapidly, there's significant road congestion and emissions, they, there's a desire for a uh, a way to create modal shift from cars. Uh, there's evidence that uh, where light rail schemes have, have gone into other cities, modal shift happens quite noticeably. Trams also offer a permanent way through the city, which encourages development uh, and people get uh, attached to using that uh, reliable transport system. But the big thing is those systems are very expensive. So some examples here, and I'm not uh, I'm not criticising these schemes. I'm just saying how much they cost. Uh, so Nottingham was 570 million for an extension. Edinburgh's tram system was 375 million pounds over budget. It arrived very late. Uh, Midland Metro, the new extension in the Black Country, is a 450 million pound project, essentially using an old railway line. Um, and it's only about 14 kilometres long. So the cost per kilometre is very high um, and it averages somewhere between 35 and 50 million pounds per kilometre. So why would you uh, look at doing something differently? So differently from a light rail um, tram vehicle and the light in, in the light rail is not to do with the weight of the vehicle, it's to do with the number of passengers it carries, which was previously referred to as about 300. So lighter vehicles allow you to have a, a less substantial track, uh, uh, lighter weight infrastructure, potentially reducing costs. Um, you can use eco-friendly self-propulsion, including batteries. You don't need the overhead line. Um, vehicles are designed, because we're using a lot of automotive technology in this program, they're designed for low cost manufacture from the very beginning allowing lower prices and bigger fleets. Autonomy is built into this solution from the very beginning because um, driver costs are the biggest element of operating costs. And then we're looking at how do you drive the cost out of the civil engineering. And if I just show you there, we've done some comparative work between what the cost of a, an urban very light rail solution would be in comparison to traditional light rail um, and I'm not going to dwell on this but most of the aspects in a system uh, there are opportunities for cost reduction. So the Coventry Very Light Rail project um, came about in 2016 and Coventry City Council asked WMG is it possible to make a tram system that will cost in the region of 10 million pound per kilometre 
there are four projects that began in 2018. WMG is leading the vehicle design and the novel track design. Uh, route selection uh, is being led by Coventry City Council and the operations, and that will include things like passenger information, security, ticketing, uh, and potentially the operation of the, city, uh, of the system is Transport for West Midlands. Now, we, we were driven by a specific uh, set of requirements from Coventry. We did a lot of work on what size the vehicle should be. Should it be two car, three car? Should it carry 300 people? In the end, we came uh, around to uh, a vehicle that would carry around 50 passengers, but it would run on a three to five minute headway. Uh, it would be autonomous ready. Uh, that's not to say the first uh, route will necessarily be autonomous. It depends on legislation. Uh, the vehicle will be able to um, cope with very tight curves in the city centre. Battery powered, uh, range of about 20 kilometres. Uh, rapid charging at the end of the route um, and um, uh, you can see on, on that particular image there are a number of innovative aspects that are highlighted but you can see that on your own uh, slides. Um, one of the key things here was to make sure that we were making a vehicle that would connect very well with other modes of transport whether it's um, buses, uh, autonomous pods when they come around, things like that. So we need a lot of digital technology on this, uh, on this vehicle, which will include 5G, so we can do, uh, obviously uh, we can monitor the vehicle remotely in real time. You can have a control center that can take over control if, if necessary. Um, we can collect lots of data. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we can also hopefully move to completely ticketless op op operation. Um, and uh, we can even manage uh, the times at which the shuttles uh, arrive at particular stops depending on fluctuating demand. I'm just waiting for this slide to move on and it's not. Oh, sorry, you're getting a preview there. <laughs> So there's a view in there of, uh, uh, of what the vehicle will look like inside. The vehicle is fully designed now. It's under construction and it will be available for first trials in December this year. Uh, from Coventry's perspective, they want to create a cloverleaf network uh, with vehicles running in both directions. First route has been selected, which goes from the railway station in the city centre through the centre out to University Hospital. There are 9 million passenger movements predicted on that uh, per year. And that seven kilometre route, uh, the initial analysis indicates that the benefit cost ratio uh, will be acceptable to whoever funds this project. So why are traditional tram systems so expensive? Well, it's down really to the civil engineering of the infrastructure for the track, et cetera. No two schemes are the same. There's not a lot of learning passed from one scheme to another. And of course, um, there's the need in most cases to move quite a lot of utilities from under the track. Um, so we are working with Ingerop uh, on a construction, a novel track uh, construction project. Uh, it's just started, it runs for about uh, 18 months. And this is to develop a factory manufactured a kit of parts that can be taken to site. Uh, the uh, track form is relatively shallow and in many cases we're working with utilities to get their agreement that in many cases they will not want to move their equipment. And I'm not going to dwell on this because it's, uh, it's civil engineering and you probably don't think it's very exciting, but actually this is the biggest challenge in the whole project. Um, and the track, uh, the novel track, when it is developed, uh, is going to be uh, tested over at the uh, Very Light Rail National Innovation Centre, uh, which is uh, currently under construction uh, over in Dudley. So uh, coming towards the end, the sort of timetable uh, that Coventry uh, has set out, um, 
as I said, the vehicle will be ready for testing at uh, the end of this year. Um, the novel track form will be uh, available and will be constructed into a uh, special purpose um, track uh, towards the end of next year. Um, that will enable us to then run the vehicle and the uh, track in realistic uh, situations and ultimately get approval for the vehicle and the track to be used in a public transport solution. And Coventry plans to uh, be working over the next three years to get the Transport Works Act order, um, construction of the first route to begin in 2024, and the first phase of that route to open in the uh, uh, spring of 2025. So I hope that's given you an, in, uh, an idea of ways of making uh, uh, rail-based transport available to cities of medium size. Um, cities like Coventry cannot generate the um, necessary uh, financial case uh, to be able to go ahead with traditional light rail. Light rail. So uh, I hope you found that interesting. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Nick. I mean, as I said, I'll stick to my comment earlier on that. I think it's a really ambitious program and. Uh, well done on the, the achievements through it so far. So a couple of words now for our delegates. Uh, looking at the uh, panel, the gray panel in the top right of your screen, uh, you've got a, a, a bar there marked handouts. You can download all the presentations from there. In about 24 hours time, you'll get a, a, a link from uh, GoToWebinar, which will allow you to download a recording of the whole event and in the early part of next week, you'll be able to download all the slides also from RIA's website, uh, riagb.org.uk. And don't forget also questions. We've got a Q&A session at the end. We need your questions, your input, please, delegates. This is the interactive networking part of the event. Go to the questions tab and let us have your questions. Okay, so we've heard about ambition and achievement and uh, now, we have got uh, a UK SME, which has done some really properly get the drains up innovative thinking about railway signaling control systems. And a guy who's worked on this for a long time, swimming against the tide. And as a great innovator once said, only dead fish swim with the tide. So Adam Stead is a guy who's been swimming against the tide, except it's changing a bit at the moment, Adam. Really good to hear from you. Can I hand over to you, please? Hi, thanks for having me. I'm glad that I am not a dead fish. Um, I see lots of people that I know in the attendees list, so hi to people who know me. Um, my name's Adam Stead, uh, and I'm the founder and CEO of Apollo. Our journey as Apollo uh, started about three or four years ago when I was commuting into London. Um, I had worked on infrastructure projects in the past involving signaling systems. I'd worked on the Victoria Line uh, signaling project as well where you get a train now every 90 seconds it's phenomenal performance but i was commuting on heavy rail on the mainline rail network uh, thankfully i'm not anymore uh, i've moved out to the country um but you know left standing on the platform wondering where on earth's my train um why is it late again and why can't i get a seat um surely there's a better way and so I formed Apollo on a, on a mission to make rail better and a high performing system. I don't want better information during disruption. I want no disruption and I want the trains when I want them. But crucially, uh, rail needs to be affordable. Any solution that we bring about needs to be such that uh, the Department for Transport and train operating companies even and Network Rail, for them, it's a no brainer just to say, yes, we need this now. So. Um, we got thinking about the complexity of rail uh, and how that compares to other complex systems. And a chessboard's a great analogy uh, to the complexity of rail. There's 64 squares on a chessboard where the, the, the pieces can be in, in any position, but there are more combinations of pieces on a chessboard than there are atoms in the universe. So that's quite a lot of different permutations that you can get out of a chessboard. And on the mainline network in the UK, we've got 20,000 miles of track, which is divided into block sections. And to optimize your chess play, you need a giant supercomputer. And the best scientists have been working on this for years to, to solve the chess problem. They solved it about a decade ago now, or even 20 years ago, to beat the world's best players. But it's still an interesting challenge. But clearly, for this, the complexity of the rail network, 
you'd need a, an enormous supercomputer, uh, possibly bigger than any that exists today, in order to optimize in real time the performance of the railway network. So we decided to take a very different approach and thought, instead of having a central brain, what if we could make all the trains intelligent instead? And this was our starting point for our journey as Apollo. And our mission is effectively to realize autonomous trains. And that is through two angles. One is signaling and one is train operation. I clicked, it hasn't come on yet. There it is, here we go. Oh, too fast. Okay, so the first nice area that we're exploring uh, is actually the more recent area um, is autonomous train operation. And the main reason why you'd want to go autonomous of a railway is the cost of train drivers is astronomical. Uh, per train, it's £450,000 per year just to operate that, to staff that train with drivers. And the irregularity of humans and their particular needs like food and uh, toilet breaks means that you end up with situations with drivers late for duty, uh, disruption then results in chaos at the rosters. But most importantly, for any new line that's going to open, the operating cost destroys the business case. You know, you're talking about millions of pounds a year for drivers when you haven't even got a proven revenue stream. Uh, so for, for new railways, autonomy really has to be the way to go. The way we're solving it is we're putting a supercomputer on every train. Effectively, in aut uh, autonomous cars uh, today, uh, I know we don't have them in widespread use, but the technology has become scalable and affordable in the way that mobile phones you effectively have more computing power in your pocket than desktop PCs did 20 years ago. Um, similarly for autonomous cars, there's now going to be a supercomputer in every car and you can buy that technology off the shelf. It needs a little bit of adaptation to work for railway standards, but it's actually very straightforward to adopt. And that's the objective we're working towards is a, a train based uh, autonomous train operation system uh, that will work on the heavy rail network on existing lines um, so that anyone could deploy it for a return on investment within 18 months. That's our goal. And we're working on that right now. The other area we've been working on has been more of our focus for the last three years. And it's where we started out, uh, but it's become a bit more complex than we expected. And that's autonomous signaling. And we created a system which we call sentient train control. It uses innovations in internet of things, technology uh, and cloud computing in order to create uh, a signaling system that works without any trackside interlockings or signals or train detection. This is an entirely intelligent train-based system where the trains talk to them, talk to each other on the network. Um, this approach is naturally moving block, SIL4, entirely train-based with only an interface box to points and level crossings. Uh, so we hope it will slash the infrastructure cost by about 80%. And we have been doing some work with the Swiss Railways on this concept and uh, hoping that moves forward to a prototype very soon. Uh, they've been giving us some money and that's fantastic. So the two areas of business, making trains autonomous and making uh, for operation and for signaling. We're only four people, but we've got several associates who've been working with us as well and understand our system. We're building a test track uh, at the minute. It was supposed to be building two weeks ago, but uh, because of lockdown, we've not been able to get on site. Um, but 90 meters, it's G gauge, so it's equivalent to one kilometer, but very small. There's a broken train behind me, wrong side. And uh, we're hoping to get onto infrastructure to pilot uh, the autonomous driving and autonomous signaling within 18 months. Effectively, it's the same platform on the train that's used for both purposes. Um, we want to be in, in passenger service uh, within three years so that we can start rolling out more widely in CP7. If anyone wants to invest in us, we are raising investment right now. Um, and we're looking for commercial opportunities to underpin that from any private investors. So anyone who's building a new railway, we'd love to speak to you. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, as I said, completely turning the, the existing paradigm on its head and with it an opportunity to drive performance and cost reduction. So that's a key element uh, of a railway system. Another key element, and, and I know this goes back to what Tom was saying, is the way we work with our, with our passengers, how we make sure they're well informed and how we regulate the service around that as well. So uh, Mike Lloyd of Junction has been doing a lot of work in this area. And he's going to give us a quick summary of that now. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm Mike Lloyd, I'm Chief Executive of Junction. Um, a couple of colleagues with me, Emlyn and Jack, today. 
and uh, if uh, if we've been in a physical meeting, I'd have said go and chat to them during the coffee break. But uh, um, please do uh, get in touch if if you're interested in anything that that I've talked about today. So junction. Uh, try and move on to the next slide. Just wait for a second or two. Okay, so Junction, um, for those of you that don't know us, our mission is basically to improve experience for rail passengers using modern digital technology. And um, we are a scale-up business based down in London and Shoreditch. Um, and we work with quite a number of metropolitan oper uh, operators. Uh, so MTR Crossrail, London Overground. And we also work um, more locally with Northern Rail, LNER, and um, we've done a couple of projects with the RSSB and Innovate UK. So we're very much in the sort of digital innovation area. Um, we're very pleased last year we got awarded as um, MTR Crossrail's uh, uh, runner up to their supplier of the year. And given that most of their suppliers normally supply the, the more physical and mon mundane things, it was great to, a small digital company um, was getting some recognition there. Um, so what sort of things have been working on? Uh, basically, we're working on a whole range of different digital apps to improve rail. Um, as, as we all know, uh, railways have perhaps been a little bit slow to adopt some uh, of the digital innovation uh, that we've seen in other areas. So if I can get on to the next slide. Uh, right, so um, this is a, 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 an application we did for Crossrail uh, uh, over the last couple of years. It's what we call the customer experience app. Um, those of you that know the way that uh, things are set up in London, Transport for London obviously is the, um, the operator and they're responsible for direct communications with customers. Uh, uh, Crossrail or Elizabeth Line, uh, as they're now known, are the people who uh, uh, have the concession. Um, we produced a, an iPad-based tool here for the customer experience staff on the stations to use and it takes lots and lots of uh, real-time feeds in and provides up to the minute information about where the trains are, um, whether they're a bit late, what time they're arriving next, how much it costs to get from A to B, how you can plan your journey from where you are to where you want to go to. Um, it means that the, uh, the, the uh, frontline staff have everything they need instantly to answer any question that a, a passenger comes up to and asks them about. So um, this is something that we think uh, is very applicable to being delivered directly to passengers. In the case of London, this is not something um, uh, we're able to do at the moment. That's, that's in the hands of, of TfL. But in a, uh, another uh, metropolitan area, um, clearly this could be adapted quite easily um, and provide an alternative to uh, high cost fixed um, signalling systems uh, such as that uh, that you'll be familiar with in, in London and other places. Um, another app that we have worked on which I think may have applicability to the sort of area that we're looking at, um, we've been working on a very innovative journey planner um, which is designed for people with hidden disabilities. Uh, it takes a totally different point of view to uh, planning journeys. Instead of trying to get the cheapest or the fastest journey, it looks to try and minimize stress minutes, as we call them. So it takes account of people's sensory requirements, their accessibility needs. In order to build this, um, we needed to, um, some underlying journey planner technology. In the end, we found and, and worked with an open source project called Open Trip Planner. It's used in a number of metropolitan areas in uh, Northern Europe, Finland, uh, a number of cities in the USA. And um, we built a complete uh, trip planner of the whole of the UK, which is actually the largest implementation anyone's built with that software and using the GTFS standard. And includes um, uh, travel by foot, by bus and train to give you end-to-end -end journeys. And, it, and it's uh, really uh, helping now uh, for autistic people to, to plan their journeys around on public transport. And we included in it uh, what we call an active journey mode, a bit like the sort of thing you'd see on Google Maps, where you can uh, track your journey uh, step by step and have pictures of where you're getting to, so you know where you're going. And it includes things like communication and tracking tools um, to communicate with carers or station staff. Now, uh, my feeling is, is on the, um, the very light rail type projects, um, we could combine these types of technologies into smartphone passenger apps, 
we could replace all the expensive signage systems and give a very low cost, per, very personalized travel, travel planning experience so that people would know how long it's going to take to get from A to B, how to get there, when the next trains arrive, we could have QR codes at tram stops, um, scan for live arrival and departure boards. And it could really take a lot of the cost out of, uh, out of the passenger information infrastructure. Uh, so hopefully that's uh, uh, going to be adding to the discussion. If you want to know more, please contact me or uh, my colleague Emlyn at Junction. Thank you, Richard. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, really, passengers are the important part of the whole equation, aren't they? And and also um, covering uh, uh, passengers with different ranges of abilities and uh, with diversity involved there as well. Really important. So. <clears throat> audience delegates this is your chance now to get involved with the q a um we have a journalist and a number uh david shiris uh david asks i guess nick what is the capacity um of your uh vlr system so presenter um presenters if you can switch your cameras and microphones back on please uh, all of you so david shiris is asking uh nick mallinson uh what's the capacity of urban very light rail when you compare to a conventional tram system. Uh, Nick hasn't quite re-emerged, uh, re so Tom, can I ask you about your expectations on, on passenger numbers and capacity per vehicle, please? Certainly, I think for us, historically in West Yorkshire, we've had a transport system which is, has, has basically included a double-decker bus and a train. Um, and as we move forward with um, our transport strategy ambitions for the region, it's really important that we have the right vehicle for the right levels of demand. With the mass transit work, we, we are the demand forecast we have so far is suggesting we need a vehicle which can cater for between two to three hundred people. <coughs> now, um, per vehicle. Now, different bits of the network might need different levels of capacity. Some sections of the network might need a smaller vehicle. Um, but they need to be integrated still and working as one. So it might be for some sections, you might need a, a vehicle which can only carry 100 people or so, but the, the, the heavy lifting for West Yorkshire will be in a vehicle which can carry two to 300 people. Now there's a lot of work to be done on the business case um, as it develops to, to refine that. Um, but I think that places us squarely in the kind of the, uh, uh, the very long articulated bus space or in the, um, in the light rail space. Great, so, so Nick. Just coming back on that, so I've given you an example of what Coventry has asked for, uh, which was a vehicle that could carry 50 people comfortably, uh, so it is bus sized, um, and, but they wanted turn up and go um, uh, service, so they, they will run on a three to five minute headway. Um, we did a lot of work for Coventry looking at different size of vehicles. One of the concepts was a three car vehicle. Uh, there's nothing in the technology that would stop us creating a three car vehicle that would be completely battery powered. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I say, Coventry is a smaller city than Leeds. Um, uh, it's not a big metropolitan area. Uh, and their um, decision was to go for a smaller vehicle. Um, and of course, with COVID-19, there may actually be pressures in the future not to cram so many people onto vehicles. But um, there, was, there was a good reason why we went that way, but it doesn't, wouldn't stop Leeds being able to, um, to access a very light rail um, vehicle solution. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, Julian Heathcote uh, asks, um, for an autonomous vehicle with no driver, how do you cope with sudden obstructions on the track? Uh, for example, um, vandalism. Not that that would ever happen in Leeds. I'm, I'm absolutely sure it's far too civilised a city. But uh, so sudden obstructions on the track. Uh, I think, Nick, that kind of talks to your assertions, I think. Yeah, well, um, I did mention very briefly that we've, we've got some work going on on a uh, autonomous uh, system. Part of that is a, a number of sensors that are mounted on the vehicle. Um, those sensors uh, are very high um, resolution 
Uh, there's five, there'll be five G on the vehicle, so any anything that's on the track that shouldn't be there will be, will be detected. If it's a small piece of uh, debris, then uh, the control center will become aware of it and get that removed. If it's a big obstruction, then the crash um, avoidance system as part of the autonomy will stop any collision. Um, obviously, it's a rail-based solution, so you can't steer around it, but that's a problem that any um, rail-based system uh, would have but you know the the critical thing is that the vehicle will be connected in real time to a control center and um uh you know if there is an obstruction then one of the ways that the coventry system would address that is to bring shuttles in from the other direction so the passengers can actually be guided from one shuttle to another uh, and that way we can maintain service Great, great. That's like an electrical distribution system. If you get a cut, it's fed from both ends. Adam, um, how are you coping with uh, situations like that in your uh, in your environment? Yeah, well, it's one of the big risk areas that's kind of underdressed in rail today. When we say we have a SIL4 system, we're still using the Mark 1 human eyeball for detecting hazards on the line. Um, there are a couple of technology suppliers that are focusing on hazard detection through visual and augmented with LIDAR and radar means on rail already. Uh, we are going to use their technology that, that's, that's already out uh, in use already as a collision warning system. We're going to adapt that as it matures uh, to be part of a, a SIL4 autonomous GOA4 system. Okay. Um, Julian Heathcote asks if... Um you have a ticketless system, how do you actually uh, charge effectively? Um, uh, he asserts that uh, a large number of people still don't have smartphones. Not entirely sure that's statistically true, but uh, Tom. Yeah, I've been asked this question. Uh, let me just, uh, let, I'll let Tom speak at greater length on it, but uh, I, I've been quite brutal with Transport for West Midlands because they, they said, Oh, we, we want ticket machines at all the halts and they've got to take cash. And I said, well, you're on the wrong project then, because this is all about doing things differently. And they said, well, no, old grannies don't have smartphones. Well, I, I know that um, they do. Um, so I said, well, if they've got a smartphone, give them a free pass. It's cheaper to give them a free pass than to put all of these cash machines at stops, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my view, <laughs> you know. If they haven't got a smartphone, give them a free pass. Hands up, hands up, anybody who actually still carries cash, especially loose change. It's absolutely nobody anymore, is it, really? My trouser pockets last much longer than they used to years ago. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Nick, uh, sorry, uh, Mike, um, <clears throat> what's your opinion on charging regimes where it's worthwhile and where it's not? Um, well, I think, you know, probably if you look at the example of Transport for London, um, you know, a combination of smartphone and perhaps a smart card uh, would probably address most of the issues. And uh, obviously the two can in interoperate. Um, and uh, I, I see absolutely no requirement for cash. Um, the ticketing uh, can all be handled through sort of wallets within the smartphone as I say, or via a, 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 an Oyster card type um, product. Uh, so I don't really see that, that, that those ticket machines are required uh, and that should keep the infrastructure cost really low. Okay, we get an anonymous question about uh, how can uh, the audience, how can delegates contact you, uh, Tom, to feed in their ideas and so on. Uh, and Tom's pointed out, and you can see that on the Q&A folks if you take a look, there are a number of URLs around uh, westyorks-ca.gov.uk under the urban transit heading uh, where you can do that. Um, anonymous questioner asks, um, how do you trade off the benefits of autonomy with the potential for extra cost of a segregated route? So, Tom, have you looked at those? Um, have you looked at those trade-offs? Yeah, and just to come back in on the. Um, um the cashless question if that's okay yeah um, sure um for us inclusivity is really important um and in, an inclusive society is really important and i appreciate that 95 percent whatever the stat is now the very high stat of people who have smart 
smartphones, but there is still a 5% of, 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 of people which either don't have a smartphone or don't want to carry it around with them all the time to pay for, for whatever purchases. So for me, it's around how can we make sure that that 5% can still access the system, but not necessarily by having ticket machines at the stop. Because there's different, there is, as Nick was saying, there are different ways of doing this from necessarily having a ticket machine at the stop. But it's really important that we don't constrain access to the transport offer solely on the basis of not being able to um, carry a smartphone or, or, or digital payment with you. Um, but on your question on segregation and autonomy, um, for me, it's really important. Segregation is really, really important. Why is segregation important? It's what delivers you your reliable, fast journey times. If you don't have segregation, you're stuck in traffic um, and you don't know whether you're going to get there and what time you're going to get there. And that's why um, I think a lot of the challenges have been seen in the bus sector over the last over the last 20 years, because um, uh, buses are constantly getting slower and slower and more unreliable because of congestion from cars. And they, in effect, buses aren't segregated. So mass transit presents that opportunity to have that segregation. Now, segregation then also provides you that opportunity to look at autonomy. So um, for me, the most important thing is segregation. And then the second thing is then, how do we then make this a value for money system? Um, of which, as, um, as Adam was pointing out earlier, there are a lot of cost savings, which can be made through um, kind of the operational cost side by not having drivers on the vehicles because of the, um, the high overheads which, that, uh, which comes into. And it's really important. We've, we really understand both the, the pros and the cons of, of, of drivers and operation of the vehicle from a safety and certification sign off these are the technology and opportunities which they can they can bring. So we're really keen to understand what the opportunity is for autonomous operations, but not wanting to yet just constrain ourselves to a particular technology or particular solution. Great, thank you very much indeed. But We've got some really good questions. Um, <laughs> yes, the commentary system. Uh, I mean, there's a big difference between uh, creating a new route in um, a city where it's under redevelopment uh, and you can put in segregated tracks, etc., and actually putting the system into quite an old uh, established uh, uh, city. So one of the drivers of the Coventry scheme is to make solution a solution that will allow the shuttles to operate in traffic. And uh, in fact, we are work we are talking with Apollo already on a, a particular project that would allow their system to help schedule the traffic in a much more efficient way um, and avoid any disbenefit uh, to one mode or the other. Um, okay. So, Nick, uh, so uh, Nick, thank you. That that's a that's a really useful summary. We are running out of time, so. Just one little thing we want to do is we want to use this assembled group we have to do a poll <clears throat> to ask everybody, uh, presenters and uh, delegates all together. So my colleague Milda is going to introduce a very short, i.e. one question poll. Milda, are you ready to go with that? Hi everyone, this is Milda from Rio. So we will just want to ask you what are what is the biggest barrier for railway to become a major player in the um, urban transport? So you will have uh, 30 seconds to uh, to finish the poll. I hope you can see that now. There we go, the results are coming in. So 20% of people voted, please do vote. Fantastic, 40% of attendees have voted. We hear you have a few more seconds to, to finish and then we will see the results at the end. Okay, I will now close the poll and show you the results. Okay. Out. That's, 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 a, that's a great result, isn't it? Because I think everything we've talked about today is about using absolutely up-to-date technology to reduce the cost of systems. And it's the cost not just of the implementation, but also the cost of... Um, uh, of uh, operating the system as well. I'm glad that people are thinking about that. So I want to say a huge thank you to all of our presenters today. I want to say thank you to all the delegates who've hung in there. It's great. Uh, five days, nearly 600 delegates, I think, in total this week. It's been absolutely great. Uh, thanks, everybody, for that. Um, we will not be able to leave the uh, conversation open to download handouts any further. 
but you will be able to get handouts next week from reagb.org.uk and you will get the chance to download a recording in an email in about 24 hours. So thanks also to my colleagues, to Milda, David, and the whole team behind the scenes who worked very hard to make this series of events happen. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing people at our future Unlocking Innovation events. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.